Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. I became a grandpa four years ago, and I have to say, it has truly changed my life. I'll never forget the moment my daughter Emily and son-in-law Brian called me to ask me over to their apartment. They said they had a gift for me. And when I opened up the box that they handed to me, out popped a bright red, smallest I've ever seen, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim jersey. Now that's my favorite baseball team, and it's Emily's favorite baseball team as well. When I pulled it out of the box and turned it around, What was written on the back was truly inspiring and just literally melted my heart. It said, Grandpa's fan since 2017. And that's when they told me that they were expecting a baby and I was going to be a grandfather. I will never forget how my whole life changed. My whole world changed in that moment. I'll never forget the first time I held little Isaac in my arms. I truly melted. And now, even though he's four years old and he acts like he's about 17, uh, my days are very, very full knowing that this grandson is here with us in this world. And now Lisa and I have three grandkids running underfoot between our two families in the Marsh household and family get togethers are so much fun. I love spending time with my precious granddaughters and my grandson. But, you know, before they were born, I had no idea that they were going to be such a huge blessing to me. And I know Lisa feels the same way, too. I'm Roger Marsh, and you are listening to Family Talk. Being grandparents is wonderful, but when grandkids become teenagers, though, grandparents can have the tendency to step away become less engaged. There are natural barriers that spring up that make it more difficult to stay connected with your grandchildren, of course. But despite these challenges, though, our guest today here on Family Talk is encouraging grandparents to stay involved and become a safe place for their grandkids. Our guest is Mark Gregston, and he's the founder of Heartlight, a Christian boarding school for troubled teens located outside Longview, Texas. Mark recently sat down with our co-host, Dr. Tim Clinton, to talk about the absolutely vital role that grandparents can play in their grandkids' lives. Let's listen to that conversation right now here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. There are natural communication barriers between grandparents and teenage grandkids. Uh, New and old cultures collide. Uh, Relationships sometimes fly out the window. Hurtful words stab at a grandparent trying to help. A lot of memories are missed, and arguments explode often in a family. Uh, The teenagers want attention and relationships. Grandparents, they want that too, and they want to help. Today on Family Talk, a division of the James Dobson Family Institute, you're going to hear practical tips on how to start grandparenting teens in a way that fosters connection. As Christian grandparents, the primary emphasis should not be on what you leave to your grandkids' bank accounts when you go to heaven, but what you've deposited in their hearts that has eternal impact. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, co-host of Family Talk. Mark Gregston uh, began his work with teens 40 years ago when he was a youth minister and then an area director for Young Life. In 1989, Mark and his wife Jan moved with their two children to Longview, Texas, where they founded Heartlight, a residential counseling center for struggling teens and families in crisis. He's authored nearly two dozen books, including his newest one entitled Grandparenting Teens, Leaving a Legacy of Hope. He's also the host of the nationally acclaimed radio program, Parenting Today's Teens, heard on over 1,800 radio outlets across North America. Mark and Jan have four grandchildren. Mark, welcome to Family Talk. Oh, well, Tim, thanks. It's great to be here. This is a, ought to be a big day for you because you now get to meet your number one fan and uh, huh. and I get to meet you. I've been a fan of yours. I've been a fan of Dr. Dobson ever since I could hear uh, or maybe since I started listening a number of years ago uh, to anyone and it was him. And so uh, I'm most grateful for that. Thanks for having me. Well, we're honored to have you. Mark, as we get started, 40 years, you and Jan working with teenagers, um, those kids, when they're hitting that kind of tough time in life, that rocky road of adolescence, um, take us back. How did you get called into that? And yeah. uh, where's God led you? That's an interesting deal. When I was 19, um, somebody walked up to my wife to be and I and said, uh, would you like to lead a young life club? And I said, well, sure, we'll do that. Within two weeks, 
a man walked up to me and just said, um, hey, I'm struggling with my son. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, let him come live with me. And he did. And so I was a sophomore in college and this young man lived with us. I was leading Young Life Club. A church came and said, you need to uh, come work for us. I did for a number of years. And I was always pulled toward those kids that were struggling, uh, having a tough time, not understanding, you know, perhaps what scripture means or how you uh, engage that in a world that is confusing for them. And, and so I just said, this is where I think I'm going. And, and Jane and I have been together, you know, since ninth grade when this Christian band uh, came through Tulsa, Oklahoma. Our first date uh, It's called Led Zeppelin. And uh, <laughs> and that was our first date. But we've been together and we've done this forever. And, and somebody says, well, how did God lead you through this? I have no idea. It was never a choice. I never saw myself doing this. I never had this inclination to write books. I never thought I would be living with more than eight kids. I now live with 60 high school kids that come from all over the country. And they're wonderful kids. They're great kids. They're just making poor decisions, um, or maybe they've had something happen to them. And so we surround them with a love like they've never felt before and engage them and counsel them through the difficulties of life and help them apply what they've learned early on in life to a world that, that is sometimes turbulent for them. You know, Mark, growing up is a little different today than it was yeah. when we were growing yeah. up. And we, we tongue-in-cheek joke about what we grew up in, with in the rock and roll era and all that. But, Mark, um, these kids yeah. are getting bombarded by an online world that's insane, coming at them from pornography to values and different things. And, by the way, the loneliness and the lack of connection and more. You, um, you've helped an army of parents rescue their kids. Mark, you, you've taken a turn here, and you're challenging grandparents. I love this. You said one of the greatest resources for rescuing and providing stability for kids is grandparents. You're right. Teens need a little bit of wisdom. They're not getting it from the normal places because they are so bombarded by uh, with information that hits them from all sides. When you and I grew up, information, codified information in this world doubled every 13 years. Isn't that amazing? You know how quickly it's doubling now? Every hour and a half. And next year, wow. it'll be instantaneous. And what that's doing is giving our kids so much information that they now don't need information, wisdom. That's what they're looking for. But the problem is the way the world has become so critical, and I'm not an anti-world kind of guy. Don't, please don't hear that. Uh, but the world would become so critical that it's just about ruined every authority in their life so that they would usually go to for wisdom. And they're not getting that wisdom from those normal places that you and I did when we were growing up. And so they're looking for it. They're trying everything. They're, they're trying to fill that void in their life. And what they want is a little bit of gray hair to speak to them and, and to give them not just their opinion, but they're longing for someone to give them perspective, to give them hope, to give them uh, a taste of, of something that they would long for the rest of their life. And they're looking for help of how to apply all these Christian values and principles to the world that they live in, not the world that we want them yeah. to live in, but the world that they live in. And it's one of the most ignored groups of people, uh, I would say teens are. And the other part of it is uh, older folks, by golly, they get ignored as well. You know, out of all the people that have lived age 65 and beyond since the beginning of time, 82% of those people are alive today. It's the greatest resource we have to the greatest need, which are young people that are struggling to look for help and gain a little bit of hope and encouragement in a world that's very confusing for them. There's a big gap often between the culture and how we do life up yeah. in years versus that young culture and the connection that's like ships missing each other in the in the middle of the night that's probably the biggest piece here that we need to figure out isn't it it is here's the reason those ships are being the, the winds have shifted they run differently uh, they're not made the same. And the tendency is we use our old school style of engaging with kids, thinking that what we did in the preteen years is going to be effective in the teen years. And, and this is the only time that I tell people they're wrong. 
I, I really never tell people they're wrong, but I tell them this. If you think that the skills that, that got you those world's most greatest mom and the world's greatest dad, T-shirts and coffee mugs during the preteen years, that those skills are going to work during the teen years, you are wrong. Yeah. Uh, you've got to shift your style. And the first place that a, a grandparent has got to look at is going, okay, what is it about me that is keeping that from happening? What am I angry? Am I, do I always voice my opinion? Am I always talking all the time? I mean, am I incessant? Am I more concerned about my program of, of, of uh, helping a kid get to a different place or I'm more concerned about them? Do I not listen? Am I obnoxious? Am I a nerd? Am I, am I somebody that's so disconnected with culture that all I do is come across as an authoritative, judgmental uh, person who's demanding perfection? And it, I, I've got to look at myself first before I look at kids and and say, you know, let's look at the speck in your eye. I've got to look at the log in my eye and say, yeah. is there something about me that needs to change? Lord, search me. Know my heart. See if there's any hurtful way in me, because I may be the cause of the very thing that's keeping us from connecting. And it may be just because I'm, I'm not loving my kid with the right love language. Yeah, you know, there's more than five love languages. There's huh. hundreds of love languages. It may be that that I am doing things that are pushing them away. It may be that I'm still trying to teach them when I need to be training them. I need to train them up. And there's a difference in those two. And, and so, I, I mean, that's kind of in the book, what I talk about is shifting from a teaching model to a training model so that you're preparing your child, just not trying to shove more information down their throat because they've had it up to here. They don't need any more information. We've taught them well. We've taught them well. This is how you live this out. You can watch me. They need to see the word become flesh and dwell among them in such a way that it's attractive. And they go, I like this. I really like this. I can do this. And so, so I think that's the first place that somebody's got to look and say, what is it about me that needs to be doing something different? A relationship? Yeah, I think the second part of that is saying, what is it about my home? Am I too much of a perfectionist? Do I have too many rules? I mean, I've got grandkids that are, you know, eight to 21 years old. I don't have any rules in my house. I mean, there's a few, you know, like don't burn it down, you know, uh, close the refrigerator door, and, you know, but I mean, there's not many, but I don't correct them. If they're wearing something I don't like, if they park the wrong place in our driveway, I don't care. I want them to have a place of rest. You come here and you find a sense of encouragement. I'm going to cook you the best meal. We're going to talk about what you want to talk about and more than anything else have somebody that listens to you and wants to hear your heart. And after you deal with those two things, now let's start dealing with their stuff because you've created an environment, a relational environment that welcomes change. And that means change for you as well as a grandparent. You're listening to Family Talk, a division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, host. And our special guest today is Mark Gregston. He is the author of a brand new book called Grandparenting teens, leaving a legacy of hope. Mark, uh, I can imagine people just saying, let me turn that up. I, I want a stronger relationship with my grandkids. I want to figure this out with my kids, how that we can have a true legacy impact. I want that relationship, mm -hmm. Mark. That's at the heart of all this. But let me ask you, Mark, um, I didn't really know my grandparents growing up. Yeah. Honestly, my, my grandfathers were both gone and my grandmother on my mother's side, she had lost her eyesight. And I can really recall very few instances of being around her. I never got to know her. And then my dad's mother, Grandma Daisy, uh, she would come and stay with us a couple times, but didn't spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. But when I think of grandparenting, you know, I'm thinking about Julie and I. We have a brand new granddaughter, Olivia. And Mark. Yeah. I can't get enough of that girl. It's just like she has changed my <laughs> life and my vocabulary. Hey, Papa girl. Yeah. Hey, Minnie Mouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Mark, what was it like for you? And, you know, a lot of people don't have this connection for a moment. And why, again, is this becoming so prominent and so important? It, what happened to me is I, I became a grandparent at age 46. You know, my daughter came to me and said, I'm pregnant. And she gave me this grandpa shirt. And I kind of went, oh, gee, you got to be kidding me. 
you know, and, <laughs> and in my excitement, but in my head, I was going, I'm not that old. And, and I was. And, and so I told her over the next few weeks, I said, hey, I just want you to know that I don't do babies real well. And I don't do, you know, elementary school kids well. And I really don't like middle school kids. And I really don't, you know, I just kind of went through this thing, excusing myself that, that when they get to be teenagers, I'm, I'm all in. I mean, you can count me in for anything. You know, when I heard uh, my granddaughter's voice, her first cry, it was almost like God in, enlarged my heart and showed me a love that I've never had before and showed me that I was capable of something more than I ever have been. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it changed my life. And that was 21 years ago. And it changed it in such a way that I thought, okay, I want to make sure that I'm involved. I, it's a mulligan. I mean, I get to do it over. What I miss with my own kids, now I get to do for my grandkids. So now my daughter comes to me and says, dad, it's almost like you like them more than us. And I go, uh, I do. You know, or she may say, you want to spend time with them and not us. Um, I do. There's something special about that. And because of that, that's why I kind of move farther into saying, then how do I maintain that relationship during the teen years? Because as their social circles begin to expand, usually grandparents are the ones that are the first ones to be lopped off. And they the, miss their it. whole world's changing, Mark, everything around them, their social network. They start looking to their friends for uh, guidance and information. And they don't want to hang out so much or involved in sports. Kids are so busy. Families are so busy. And it's like grandma and grandpa are out on the out on the peripheral or something. Well, yeah. And I, and I thought at that time that I would just it would be easy just to keep, you know, doing the same thing I was doing. And I realized that's not going to work. I got to do something different. I thought I was going to be able to coast through these years because I'm so good with teens. Surely my own grandkids would would love me more than everybody else during those time. And I found I had to work twice as hard during those teen years because there are other things that are pulling them. You know, maybe the reason they don't want to spend time with me is because they're getting bored with me. Maybe they're tired of hearing stuff. Maybe I'm no longer exciting. Maybe you know, when a video game is more exciting than a grandparent, then we're not going to change the world of video games. But I want to change the world of a grandparent's role in the life of a child so that they can get something that's very real. You know, I, I, I don't want to be replaced by a video game. I don't want to be replaced by TikTok and uh, Snapchat. Yeah, I want to remain engaged yeah. with them. I want to use everything I can to communicate with them, but I want to do things with them as well. Because at the core of it, Tim, is this. I, I really believe that, and most people know that I was the Oklahoma Bible quiz champ of <laughs> 1969. I mean, I believe that when you hide God's word in your heart, it will come out. I mean, and so my job is not to just preach, preach, preach. My job is to be present where they can see me and how I live my life, how I engage with people and what I do, and to walk blamelessly so that I'm an example before them because they don't have any examples anymore. And they want that desperately. So if they want that desperately and they're looking mm -hmm. for something, then, then what I have to work on is making sure I'm spending time with them. I want to grandparent them like God parents me. That's what I'm longing for. And I think people undercut that. They think we have to go back and teach, teach, teach. And I go, no, 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 you don't. You have to be present. You have to engage. You have to spend time. And they will see it because they're looking for it. Because this is what you've trained them up to be. Hmm. There are millions of uh, grandparents out there who are parenting right now. They've had to step in and become, yeah, quote, mom yeah. and or dad, if you yeah. will, even though it's papa and nana at the same time, Mark. Speaking to them, they're probably saying, you're right, but it's exhausting. But, Mark, you're, you have to be intentional, don't you? You have to step in and work on building that relationship because if you don't, this thing will go sideways. Absolutely. You know, and, and to that grandparent that's acting like a parent and has to do that, I would I would say this, hey, be the parent on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but on, on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, be the grandparent. I mean, it's, it's a dual role. I mean, so enforce mm -hmm. rules some of the time, but not all the time. Uh, pick out what's important, what really matters. Uh, choose which hill you're going to die on and lighten up a little bit. God's going to use you, and, and you can trust that God has been involved in the life of your child. So sit back and relax a little bit and quit 
taken it so serious, deal with the hard issues, but listen. And, and there's so many things facing kids today that we never had to deal with when we were in high school or junior high, that one of the best defenses is learning how to listen to their heart and not passing judgment immediately. Just let it set. Sometimes kids, you know, just verbalize things because they're processing out loud. And so I don't always have to correct them all the time you will have an opportunity eventually to share those things with them in time if you just listen. Mark, you've spent your life mm. working with teens and families, especially those who are in trouble. Give us the sugar stick stuff, Mark, up front, the two, three things that you say, listen, Tim, these are the most common mistakes that grandparents are making, yeah. and it's why they're not connected with their grandkids, especially their teen grandkids. Yeah, here's the first one. You're not listening. You're not listening. Sometimes you're so concerned, grandma and grandpa, about your own program that you forget this is about them. It's not about you. When you move into the teen years, it's about them. It's not about you. When Paul said, I have no one that looks after the interest of others, they're all looking after themselves, you know, except for Timothy. You know, and so a grandparent needs to be one. I'm looking to your interest, not mine. Discipline now is not giving punishment. Discipline is helping a child get to where they want to go from where they don't want to end up. And so I, I think it's, it's changing that perspective and it's listening to their heart more than anything else. The second thing is when they, when, when they start talking, don't correct or judge them. You don't have to let them process it out loud. You have a long conversation with them the rest of their life. That's the goal. It's not little bits of conversation that uh, give them one, one little nugget of truth and one little nugget of truth and one little nugget of truth at different times. It's almost like we get this idea, well, I've got to do that. I've got to pass something on to them. Let me, I, I assure grandparents, you are passing something on to them. And sometimes the, the, the one that appears wise is the one that's the most quiet that listens and says, hey, I got an idea. What do you think? Hey, you want an opinion or you want an hmm. answer? And sometimes a kid will say, neither. Okay, I'm not going to give it. Instead of always giving answers, start asking questions. Because once a child realizes that you're connected with them, then there is something about that that, that they know they can come to you. And, and that's what I want. I mean, I live with 60 high school kids. Uh, it's interesting to me. I'm 66 years old. I still feel like I'm 21, but there's a part of me that, that always thought that this youth thing, this youth minister thing or young life thing is going to pass and kids won't want to spend time with me one day. I have more kids wanting to spend time with me today than I ever have in my life. Really? And it's not because I'm teaching, 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 because I don't do that, but I listen well and I spend a lot of time and I make myself available and I'm not judgmental. And I've welcomed them and I want to create an atmosphere that says, you know, and that would be the third thing, that the message that there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. That's when a kid comes home and says, I think I'm gay. I've, I've been smoking pot. Hey, when they're 21 years old, I'm going to move in with my girlfriend. I, it's saying to him, I just want you to know, I, I, you, you can ask me questions about those things and I'll be happy to talk to you. But I want you to know there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. And the power of that love has an amazing way of creating an atmosphere of change and positions you as a grandparent in their life so they will come to you and start asking those tough questions about how do I apply the values that I've been taught and I embrace into a world that is completely different than when I learned those things. And, and I think that's where a grandparent has an amazing opportunity to offer something that no one else could ever give. Hey, we've wrapped up uh, today's program here, Mark. We're running out of time, but there's so many nuggets in your new book, Grandparenting Teens, Leaving a Legacy of Hope. I want to share those with our listeners uh, in tomorrow's broadcast. But hey, give us a yeah. closing word, Mark, from you to all of us about just pressing in relationships. It's all right there. Yeah. Get it right, you're blessed. Get it wrong, and it's going to be a journey. Yeah. You know what? God isn't keeping you around. So you can hook up an RV and drive to Arizona and play shuffleboard the rest of your life. <laughs> God's keeping you around because he needs you desperately in the lives of your teen grandchildren to offer them hope, to offer them help, a sense of encouragement, and 
it will change the destiny of your family. Wow. Such powerful words from Mark Gregston, our guest today here on Family Talk. You know, I'm a grandfather myself, and I listened very closely to that entire conversation between Mark Gregston and Dr. Tim Clinton. I don't think there's a grandparent among us who does not want to reach the hearts of our grandkids. And I hope that you will take some of the advice that Mark gave today and implement listening and loving over talking and teaching in your relationship with your grandchildren. I know I will. Now, if you missed any of today's broadcast, or if you'd like to learn more about Mark Gregston, his ministry to youth, or his new book, Grandparenting Teens, Leaving a Legacy of Hope, you can find all of that when you visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. Or you can give us a call at 877-732-6825. Well, thanks so much for listening today, and make sure you join us again tomorrow as Dr. Tim Clinton and Mark Gregston talk some more about how you can reach the heart of your grandchild. That's coming up right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.